Hello and welcome. My name is Stacey Bersani, Program Manager for IEEE Ada Kappa Nu. IEEE is the world's largest technical professional organization dedicated to advancing technology for the benefit of humanity. We thank you all for joining us for our 2021 Pathways to Industry program. Before we begin, please note a few housekeeping items. At the bottom of your screen are engagement tools for you to use. All tools are resizable and movable, so feel free to move them around to make the most of your space. Note that we recommend using a wired internet connection to access today's presentation and closing any programs or browser sessions running in the background that could cause issues. There is no dial-in number for this event. Please make sure your, com your computer speakers or headset are turned on and the volume is up so that you can hear our presenter. You can find additional answers to some common technical issues by clicking the orange question mark uh, help icon at the bottom of your screen. If you have any questions for today's speaker, you may submit them through the Q&A widget on your screen or click the purple Q&A icon at the bottom of the screen. We will answer as many questions as time allows. If you click the green resources icon at the bottom of your screen, you'll find more information about upcoming events, including the last session in the Pathways series happening today at 4 p.m. and the interactive live networking sessions, one following this session immediately and the second at 5 p.m. today. That's 5 p.m. Eastern. Finally, the on-demand link for today's event will be emailed to all registrants. Our virtual event today is Acing the Interview, Four Components Critical to Getting Noticed. During this session, Phil Bautista, founder of Bull Creek Data, will review the four key components critical to effective communication and tips for interviewing, covering both in-person and remote interviews. If you would like to post on Facebook about this event, please use the hashtag IAMHKN. At this time, I'd like to hand it over to IEEE HKN Director, Nancy Oston. Thank you, Stacy, and welcome to everyone. Yes, this is day three of our Pathways, and it's our 2 o'clock session, Acing the Interview, and we have an amazing speaker for you today. So I know you're going to get a lot out of this session, so I'm so glad you were able to join us. I mean, it's so hard to get noticed today in this hiring environment. And there's so many skills that are really critical and necessary, those communication skills, not just to get the interview, but how do you get through it? And I think that's something that uh, I think will help a lot of our students who are joining us. So what I loved in your bio is you described your superpower as leading teams of people through different backgrounds. And I, I think that is a superpower, so I can't wait to hear more about that. Uh, Phil Batista um, is going to use work from Starbucks to the U.S. House of Representatives. That's quite a jump. And Air Force and Navy. University of Arizona and a, one of the SUNY, so that's great. He also worked on the world's first microcontroller scuba diving computer. That sounds great. And it's Apache helicopters. Wow, great things. And I know um, some of you will be really interested. Phil learned how to pilot the space shuttle. I want to hear more about that. But one of the things I talked to Phil about, I hope we'll touch on, is um, his amateur radio work um, in a program he did recently on zombie apocalypse. So, again, lots of cool stuff to talk about, Phil, so I'm going to hand it right over to you so you can, um, can really enlighten our audience with a lot of your experiences and information. Thanks so much for being here today. Thank you, Nancy. I greatly appreciate the opportunity to address your audience today. Um, again, this is Phil Batista, and uh, I'm, I'm just pleased to be here and to discuss with you how to dissect communication to be effective in your interview. I am an IEEE senior member, and uh, we're going to talk about effective communication. We're going to list what I have found over a number of years that I that that compose the four key components in order for effective communication. And by the way, these apply whether you're communicating in person or on the radio or over the internet. Uh, basically, these even apply to such situations as an automobile accident uh, and to try to avoid that and in, in, in also uh, with respect to relationships and projects that you can be managed. So um, I found that these have been effective tools in, as Nancy has said, uh, managing projects from, from NASA to the House of Representatives, from Starbucks to 7-Eleven, from, uh, you know, 
Dell computers to Compaq. Uh, and these are also effective uh, in the current project that I'm on here at the Pentagon. So those four key components listed here in order are the initial initiation, the acknowledgement, followed by the request and the response. So the bullet here that I have says that anything short of these four critical steps falls short of effective communication. Down here at the bottom is an asterisk that says, you may need to repeat some of these steps to refine your transaction to make sure that you complete it. In other words, you may initiate a conversation, be acknowledged, initiate your request, and get a response that does not necessarily complete your request. And you may have to go back to the response from the response to the request phase and back into the response uh, an iterative number of times in order to complete your effective communication. I like this drive-through model. By the way, I can't claim responsibility for this. Jonathan Chu, who is an Imagineer for, for uh, Walt Disney, uh, he likes to talk about the drive-through model. So I've borrowed his quote-unquote drive-through model. This is basically when you pull up to the drive-through and this is the entire process of placing your order and picking it up. So the initiation. The initiation phase is when you drive up to the speaker. Typically they have sensors under the ground or a camera or some sort of uh, proximity sensor that, I, that notifies them that you have driven up to the um, location where you'll place your order. That may, that may light a light, that may sound a bell inside the, the order window where they take your order. So that's the initiation phase. You drive up to the speaker. Now, if you don't drive up, if you stay back from where they can sense and the, and the sensors don't trip or the camera doesn't pick you up, they will not know you're there and they will not acknowledge you. If they don't know you're there, they can't take your order, and then you're stuck at the initiation phase. But once you complete the initiation phase and drive up to the speaker, trip the sensor, show up on the camera, the proximity sensor identifies you, you're there, and they, they're aware that you're there, then you can move forward to the acknowledgement phase. The acknowledgement is where they ask, may I take your order? If they don't ask to take your order, you can't get what you want, right? So that's the second step, the acknowledgement. So now you've driven up, they know you're there, they've acknowledged that you're there, they've asked for your order, and then you make your request. Your request is, I'd like a Big Mac and large fries and a chocolate shake. If you don't tell them what you want, obviously they can't fill it. That's the request. The response is, if they say, okay, your order is, and they'll repeat it back to you typically, right? If they say, you want a filet of fish, Diet Coke, and small fries, you say, no, 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 that's not it. So again, that's the response, but you may have to go back to the request and say, no, I said I'd like a, a Big Mac, large fries, and a chocolate shake. And at the point where they respond and repeat your order correctly, then you've completed all four phases of the effective communication as I've listed them here. And again, completion of these uh, uh, steps will guarantee that at least they know what you've ordered. In amateur radio, we use a similar communication process. I am an extra class amateur radio operator, which is the highest level of license that the FCC here in the United States offers for amateur radio. Uh, I'm also involved in emergency services. So when you're in a situation such as a disaster or some sort of emergency communication, it's imperative that you communicate effectively. And that means all four phases of initiation, acknowledgement, request, and response. One of the areas that we, we use is HF communication, and there are certain um, acronyms and, and things that we use to communicate, such as CQ or QSL or 5x9 that may not be necessarily uh, familiar with most of you, but I can, I can explain those soon. So the initiation. If I go on my HF radio and I transmit and I say, CQ, 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 this is Alpha Alpha 5 Echo X-ray, the CQ in the language of the amateur radio means I am seeking you or I'm looking for anyone. 
anyone anywhere basically right so cq means anyone anywhere so i'm saying hey i'm out here i'm looking for anyone that's my initiation and i'm giving my call sign so they know who i am the acknowledgement is someone may come back and say okay alpha alpha five echo x-ray this is kilo mike six mike delta fox km6 mdf now that's the acknowledgement the the other station the responding station km6 mdf it said hey alpha alpha five echo extra i hear you and 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 i'm responding to you that's the acknowledgement so typically i would request from that station a signal report and i in the the way i would make that statement is i would i would keep my mic once they stop talking and I would say, Kilo Mike 6, Mike Delta Fox, this is Alpha Alpha 5 Echo X-Ray. How copy? In other words, how do you read me? Please tell me how, how I'm coming uh, into your radio. Please give me a signal report. That's my request. The response may come back and they say, okay, Alpha Alpha 5 Echo X-Ray, I copy 5 by 9. 5 by 9 in the language of amateur radio, 5 is for loud, so that's the, that's the, uh, the 5 part. And nine is is the uh, clarity, right? So they may say five by five means you're loud, but I can't really hear you. That's the response. And by the way, sometimes in amateur radio, uh, the the transmission may fade depending upon the the um, the, the ionosphere's tro uh, propagation. So I may hear the first part. I may hear alpha alpha five echo extra. I copy mm, by mm, and I, I may have to re repeat my request again. So I may have to. Uh, go through that process again. So that's how the radio model applies to the the four uh, the four areas of communication. This is standard protocol for amateur radio operators around the world for HF communication. Not so much for um, you know VHF or UHF type of communication. If we look at the physics of communication, we have a total number, most of us, hopefully all of us, of no more than two ears, right? Each human being is, is generally equipped with up to two, two ears. And the number of mouths that we have per human being is, is exactly half of that, right? So we have one mouth and two ears. So the conclusion that I make is we need to listen twice as much as we speak. When you interview with your prospective employer or someone you're looking for, a, an internship with perhaps, right? Or to gain some experience, it's important that you perform a few key steps. I have six of them listed here. The first is to research the company. Know, know, about the, know as much about the company as you can. The internet is your friend in this particular case. Google, Siri, whatever you need to use, research the company. Know what your strengths are. And by the way, something that just came up this week, uh, my eldest, interviewed with a, a real estate company and they not only wanted to know what her strengths were and, and by the way I, I omitted this and I didn't have a chance to add this one of the things you may be asked for are not just your strengths but it is fairly regular that you're asked for what your weaknesses are and I can go into how how you uh, posture those right so you may say well you know my strengths are that I'm, I'm very communicative I listen as twice as much as I speak and if they ask what your weaknesses are you may say well sometimes I over communicate and maybe I need to learn how to uh, reduce the amount of communication I have or maybe you say I I over commit and I need to learn how to manage my expectations those are actually strengths that you turn in and represent them as weaknesses. So you're actually presenting your strengths twice. Another important thing is to know what your goals are. Understand where you want to be. One years, five years, 10 years out, you, you will most likely be asked these. Also know what the company's goals are and align yourself with the company and then deliver your story. We'll go into these in just a little more detail here. When you research the company, it's important to know what their corporate goals are. It's important to know what their market share is. Are they in the top 1%, the top 5%, the top 10%? And if they're in the top 10% or the top 20%, would they like to move up to the 1% or the, the top 5%? Those are typically corporate goals that are, that are identified by their current market share. It's also important in this, in this age of virtuality to understand what the global footprint is, right? Some of you may be attending this conference from other countries. 
it's important to understand what the global footprint of the company is. Maybe you have a desire to travel, as a lot of us do, and maybe they don't have uh, a presence in a country or a part of the United States where you'd like to live. If you know from your research of their corporate goals and their market share that they're looking to expand into the Pacific Northwest and you'd love to live in the Pacific Northwest, but they don't have a footprint there, that's a strength that you can offer by understanding what their global footprint is, what their market share is, and what their corporate goals are. Knowing your strengths has several components. By this time, you've got a significant amount of education under your belt. You may have some training. You may have some certifications. So those are important to know what those are so you can represent those both in your resume and in your interview. Understand your work experience, be able to convey what your previous work history is, any internships that you may have, including the company, your position, your duties, and your accomplishments through your internships. You may also have projects, whether they're student projects, work projects, or personal projects. Maybe you volunteer at a homeless shelter. Maybe you have uh, started a, a, a GoFundMe page for a uh, for someone who's you know needs some help, that may not be something that's you were were paid to do or you have a training in necessarily, but that's a project that may you may be able to present that identifies your strengths. Also, be able to represent your core values. Some key core values are integrity, honesty, work ethic. I can tell you this past week, I was asked at three o'clock in the afternoon to provide a 1200 line task list by 0800 the following morning that I didn't necessarily want to do, want to do. But again, um, I, that my, according to my work ethic, it was required by the customer for them to be successful. So that's something that I was able to do. And that conveys my work ethic to anyone that I would happen to interview with. Know what your goals are. Where would you like to be in one year? Where would you like to be in five years, 10 years, two years is, is, a, is a likely um, period that companies may ask you. I can tell you that when my eldest daughter interviewed this past week with a real estate company, she said, my immediate goal is to work for your company and learn how I can help understand the real estate market. And in a year, I'd like to be an agent. I've already taken the education part. I've taken my real estate course. I'm going to take my certification exam here in the next month so that I can be an agent. And in one year or maybe five years, I would like to be an agent within your organization. So it's important that they understand that and understand how that fits in to their plans. Again, know the company's goals. What is their market position? What's their current market position? Are they only in the medium market? Are they in the high end market? Are you know? Are they uh, you know what their current and future market positions are? It's important to know those to to align yourself with their goals. Understand what corporate differentiators are. If you're creating a business plan to seek funding, and many of you have probably had some experience in pitching, either theoretically hypothetically or in real life, your ideas to a VC or to a board, it's important to know what differentiates your pitch or your corporation from the competition. Not just market share, not just market penetration, but the products, the services that you intend to provide or that you do provide. Understand that the products and services that are provided by the, by the corporation you're interviewing with, uh, how those play into your strengths. Understand the market impact and the strengths that they currently have and how that's differentiated. Again, you may not be asked, but it's important to prepare yourself so you can align uh, this, these uh, ideas with your, with your strengths. Align yourself with the company. Now that you know what the company's goals are, their corporate position, identify both in your cover letter and in your interview. You may have, as, as happened this week with my daughter, a phone interview. She interviewed with a, with a staff person who was driving. That told me when, when this person was driving, he wasn't looking at a resume, but she was able to verbally identify how her strengths contribute and can contribute to the company's success. Then when she interviewed in person with the CEO of the company, she was able to identify that in person and convey that information. 
about how her strengths will contribute to the company's success. When you're given the opportunity, and you should be, tell your story, deliver your story, tell the team or the person who you're interviewing with how your skills and experience and knowledge and your values will contribute to the corporate goals. Are you willing to stay after? Do you work on Saturdays and Sundays? Do you get up early? You know, do you go, do you finish emails before you go to bed? And be passionate about your story. Those are key important uh, uh, issues about delivering your story. During an interview, whether it's in person or remote, you've got a couple of options here. If you're in, if it's remote, you want to make sure that you look into the camera. I recently uh, interviewed about a dozen people for the IEEE Rising Stars Conference, and I had notes on my screen, and I had a camera that was a little off center. And even though I was trying to look in the camera, I was also reading the notes. So when you look at the interview, it looks like I'm not actually looking at the camera because I'm reading my notes. It's important when you're interviewing remotely with someone that you look at the camera. That's basically giving them their, your full attention. Number one, it's respectful. Number two, it shows that you're listening. When you're in person, obviously, you want to maintain eye contact, and you may have to turn your body or your head or both if you're interviewing with a panel of people or multiple people in the room. Don't look out the window. Don't look up. Don't look down. Look that person in the eye. Maintain that, that eye contact with the person when you're interviewing with them. That says, you've got my attention. You're important. I'm listening to you. It's also important to wait for the complete question before starting your answer. I don't know if any of you have experienced this, and especially on some of these Zoom calls that we're on, a, a particular person on the call may start to a, a question and someone else may start to answer before the entire question is stated. My, my proposal is how can you, how can you accurately respond and in, in, in give a complete answer until the question is completely delivered? It's important to wait. Same thing in radio, same thing in the drive up, right? And it's also important, important to speak clearly, enunciate clearly. Pausing before power statements is something that I tend to do naturally. And it's, uh, it's been pointed out to me in some of the interviews. Some of my colleagues have said, wow, the way that you pause before saying, you know, integration management or military intelligence or flight simulation, you know, that really drove those statements home. So I, I would recommend that you, if you can, in a natural way, and you may want to practice this, pause before making your power statements. And if you have the opportunity, use speakers' names appropriately. It's not important that you use every time that you say Nancy this, Nancy that, Phil this, Phil that. But if you if you can intersperse using their names appropriately, that that gets your attention. That actually refocuses from the the um, uh, from the the speak the listener's perspective. It subliminally refocuses their attention on you because it's like when your mom used to call your name. You know, Philip, oh, all of a sudden you refocus. If you can use their name appropriately, please do so. After the interview, and this is important, a lot of people will go to an interview, send their resume, send a cover letter, you know, have an interview, have a, and, and they, never, they never follow up. They never know what to follow up. So after your interview, you want to thank the person for their time. They have many of the things they can do with their time, but they've taken the time to talk with you. They've focused their attention on you. And so ask them uh, what the next steps are. Again, they've taken interest in you as a potential candidate for their position. Ask what the next steps are. Not just ask what they are, but be specific. Understand what the next time to action is. When is the next action going to take place? Is it tomorrow? Is it today? Is it next week? Do I need to wait 30 days? Do I have to take a disc assessment? Do I have to take a, uh, a drug test? Do I need to take a security uh, you know, background investigation? Do you need fingerprints from me? The all, uh, and as well as the next method of action, is this going, are we going to follow up via phone? Are, are you going to email me something? Are you going to set up a conference call? Are you going to pass me on to the next person? You need to know when and how you're expected to follow up. 
and then follow up on any action items. And by the way, in the busy world in which we live, in a meeting, it's okay to say, I understand that I'm taking the action item here to follow up with you in a week via email. I'm not sure I have your email address. Can you repeat it for me? Or here's what I have for your email address. Same thing if you say, well, you know, I understand that you're expecting a phone call from me. I'm not sure. Do you want me to call your cell phone? Do you want me to call your VoIP phone? Uh, you know, how, how do I communicate? Do you want me to text with you? Uh, whatever the case may be, right? So it's important to know uh, how, when, and, and what the action is to follow up. That's basically all that I have. Um, Nancy, I'm happy to take any questions if there are any. Yeah, thanks. So that's great. Now, there's a lot of there's a lot of information to unpack in there. So that's a that's a lot of good stuff. Um, you know, I think you know people. You know, even one other thing that I think is important, and I, maybe it's in you mentioned it a little bit, even in the virtual, the in person. You know, they say like what is it, 96 percent of communication is nonverbal. So I think um, maybe talking a little bit about how you use your nonverbal to communicate maybe some of these things. Um, it's not as easy. Interviewing is not exactly like ordering a Coke and fries. Um, but how could you, you know, how do you watch your nonverbal? You know, that's a great question. And, and I'm not sure how I came to, to do this, but I have noticed that when I communicate with somebody in, in person, if I'm sitting there with, with them, I want to make sure that my arms aren't folded right? That my arms aren't crossed or that I'm sitting on my hands. It's important to sit up straight. It's important to look a person in the eye. It's important to turn your body towards them. Turning your body towards them says, hey, I'm listening, right? So I, my name, Philip, means lover of horses in Greek, and I've had horses most of my life. And with a horse, if you focus your attention on that horse, if you turn your body towards the horse, the horse knows you're looking. If you turn your body away at a three-quarter angle or you turn your back on the, on, on the horse, that basically says, I'm ignoring you. You're not a threat to me. I don't really care what you're going to do, right? So it's important that they know you care. Turn your body towards them. Fold your hands, prop, maybe put them in your lap. Um, but it's important that you, again, look at them, turn your body towards them. And I will also tell you something. that That's from the, the body language. But from the cadence perspective, and this is kind of getting down into the nitty-gritty of this, but I have found in working, again, you've, you've men, mentioned some of the projects that I've been able to work on, the space shuttle or uh, other things, right? Uh, I did some work at Los Alamos National Laboratory, and I noticed that the person that I worked with had a different cadence of talking. And, and you'll find some people talk really fast and now they want to get everything out and that's how they communicate. And when you communicate with that person, if you communicate in a, in a manner that matches their cadence and matches their pitch, I, and this is just one of these subliminal things that I'm not, I'm not a psychologist. I'm not sure why this works, but I can tell you, Nancy, I have a great level of success in matching the cadence, in matching the pitch, if they talk in a low voice and you respond in a low voice and you talk slowly, then th you know, if that's how they, they talk to you and you respond, it just seems to create this bond. I can't explain it. And, and again, I don't know how, but that's those are a few key things that I've noticed over many years. I worked with a guy at Lockheed Martin, and every time he would say something, and I thought he was done because I was very excited about the project, I would start up and he was just pausing <laughs> and I learned when he says something and you think he's done, you wait and then you respond. And I mirror I, his cadence basically. Does that make sense? Does that answer your question? It does. And I think, you know, you use that pause uh, that, you know, that, and I almost just walked on you. You use that pause element when you said, I'm going to pause before I say something that's really important. So um, I, I think that's a, another great thing to look for is, you know, how do you use, you know, those kinds of cues to make sure someone is really paying attention. You don't want them to miss some very important information about you. So, um, you know, listening for their pause and planning the pause, you said it's just something that comes naturally or, you know, how can you recommend someone practice that? So, you know, here's something interesting it, with it, with Zoom and free accounts being available on Zoom, right? I actually have a paid account, but but with Zoom, you can actually do this. 
If you've got a laptop or a phone, you can create a Zoom account. It's free. And, and you can actually create a meeting with yourself, Nancy, or with a friend. And you can have a mock interview or have an interview with yourself and look into the camera. You can record. You can basically practice with your Zoom account and record to your local device or even in their cloud. And a mock interview, and you can see how you do, right? And I would say do this with a couple of people that are that have different per, differing personalities and differing cadences, right? And see how you see if there's a difference with how you respond. I've been told sometimes that I'm a chameleon, and I'm like, well, I'm not sure if that's complimentary, but what that really means is that I tend to copy the communication style of the person that I'm talking with. But I can tell you in some of these big meetings with the folks that I've got to communicate with, they tend to just walk all over each other on these calls, either unintentionally or intentionally, sometimes intentionally. But I've noticed that they, they, they recognize the difference because when I, when I speak, if, if they start to interrupt me, I just immediately stop. And, and I'm sorry. And if they don't, if I'm sorry, and if they don't, uh, if they don't, I just don't have it on my screen. So I immediately stop, right? And um, so what I've noticed is then then they they let me continue. So I guess my my point is if you record yourself, whether you're whether it's on your phone or on Zoom call, you, you can practice that. So imagine this. You know, Native Americans used to have what they had, had to call the talking stick. And you may be seeing this in movies, right? So the premise is that only the person with the stick has the opportunity to talk at that time. If you want to talk, you have to reach your hand out. That person has to give you the talking stick, and it's then your turn to talk. And if you've given the talking stick out, you don't get to talk at that point until the talking stick passes back to you. That's, that's a great thing to kind of – Keep in your mind, you know, as a, as a mental image when you're having a communication. And I can tell you, by the way, on, on the zombie apocalypse, as you, as you brought up earlier, uh, the zombie apocalypse was a workshop we did uh, in, in January of 2020. And we took the, um, a group of kids and we gave them ham radios, my ham radio. We gave, each gave, gave them a ham radio. The first thing that happened is they all started keying up the mic and talking at once. Well, you can imagine what happened. Nobody heard anybody because everybody was talking. But one of the things that they learned that we practiced in very, since very basic is, you know, you listen first, then you key the microphone, make your transmission, then you release, and then you listen. So that kind of tends to carry over into my verbal communication and when I'm on a, in a Zoom call or on a conference call or in person. Does that answer your question? does, and I think you pointed out really great where we have two ears and one mouth, so you should do this twice as much as you do this, you know, um, because I think that's a really good point. So are there cues that someone can use to understand if the interviewer wants more information or is kind of telling you to maybe you should stop talking now? Is there some kind of cues that you, you, you could maybe look for in that exchange? So, yes, and that would probably depend upon on the environment. If you're in person, so if they're, uh, if it's a remote interview and you're not in person, it, it may be difficult to tell, especially if they don't have their camera on. But if they have their camera on and they're looking away or looking down, um, and this happens very frequently where you would go to in person, when you go to a meeting, this happened a lot when I was at Dell, people would, have, people would bring the laptops up, you know, hypothetically so they could look at the materials being presented but really a lot of them are on their phone a lot of them are on their on their email or you know god forbid you know shopping or whatever facebook whatever right so if they're looking down and not at you or at the camera chances are that you've lost their attention and similarly in person if they're looking out the window or past you or down at the floor or at their phone uh you've lost their attention and a great way to do this is just to stop. Because when you stop and you have that, now all of a sudden, you know, it, it creates an oral pause. And now you think, oh, what happened? They're thinking, what happened? Oh, uh, and, and it refocuses their attention. Um, so that's, those are the cues that I would, I would say, again, if, if you've lost their, their eye contact, whether it's at the camera or looking at you, but and, and and again, from from an auditory perspective, if they continue to if they start talking over you, interrupting you, the best thing you can do is just stop. 
and let them finish their sentence. And so those are the ways that I would recommend from a Q perspective to understand how, if you're effectively communicating with them. Does that answer your question, Nancy? It does. I think you're pointing out, I think a really strong point is everyone's afraid of that silence. But sometimes in the silence is when you can get information. It kind of, people want to talk, so maybe it would, you know, trigger the other person to give you some more information that you need or make sure, like you said, you're refocusing. Um, someone asked about that weaknesses question, which is one of my least favorite questions, but I always do ask it when I interview someone about, um, you know, how do you address that again without compromising either? I think you did some good ideas about, about um, you know, flipping that. You know, I used to sometimes say chocolate, um, but humor sometimes is appropriate, sometimes it's not. You want to talk a little bit more about how to address that weaknesses question and how do you turn that, again, more examples, how you turn that into a strength? Well, you know, I wish, and I had asked my daughter if she would join this call to help kind of bring some light to her experience recently because she, when, when I brought this, the, I said the exact same thing to her. She says, I was asked that. I was asked about my weaknesses, and I didn't know what to say. I didn't want to sound arrogant, but I said, I can't really think of any. I said, well, you you, you will. And I, unfortunately, like I said, you know, I, I, I hadn't prepped her on that. But, again, if you can, in a way that isn't as – transparent as maybe some of the, the the ideas that i brought to the table and i'll ask i'm going to ask you for for one of your examples here in just a second but you know if if you can say if you could take think of a strength right communication if you can say well sometimes i over communicate sometimes i i tell person more than person more than they really need to know or want to know right then then if i was the interview i'd say well that's great i would usually like to know more information that's being given to me and, and you can tailor this by the way to who you who you're speaking with or to the audience that you're interviewing with that or and so when i when i told my i told my daughter i said well why don't you say sometimes i'm um what did i say not the over communication i said uh sometimes i over commit you know, sometimes I do more. And by the way, she has a tendency to do that. She's working on it and she gets it from me. But it, she said, well, I don't want to do that. I don't want to bring that up because then they'll think that I can't, you know, that I'm unable to to function well. And I wish I had the the um, the example. I think she brought up something like sometimes I'm sensitive to noise. But then she actually here's the neat thing. She actually said, but I can mitigate that with noise canceling headphones or if I go into another room. So she basically, by the way, managers. Uh, and correct me if I'm wrong, but tell me what you think. Managers typically don't like to only be given a problem. If you can come to management once you get your job, or if you can identify a problem and come up with at least one or two solutions, management loves that. Guess why? They have to think less about that. They don't have to stop what they're doing and come up with a solution, tell you to go do it, and then make sure that you're doing that. If you come to them and say, you know, sometimes – uh, I'm, I'm noise sensitive, but I just typically go into another room or I'll, you know, put noise canceling headphones on or I'll, you know, uh, do something else. That's, that's how, you know, if you give them a, a solution to mitigate the weakness that you've just brought up, then they feel that you understand it and you've addressed it. So Nancy, when, when someone tells you their weaknesses, can you give me one or two examples of what you've heard? Uh, well, I've heard things like similar to what you said. I, you know, I tend to overcommit or I tend to, um, you know, some people say I'm not as good at this skill and that skill. So some people do actually admit that they, they need more work on a certain skill set or this. What I like to do it, or what I think is always a good thing to do when someone says exactly what you were just saying, but I'm working on it. You know, I wish I was, you know, I wish I was stronger at this, but I've been taking a class. Or I'm planning on taking a class to do that, or maybe I over communicate, but it's one thing I'm aware of and I'm working on, so that you know you can tell people that you have self awareness, because I think that that often can be missed that your own self awareness of some of the things that you do. What do you think of just letting them know that even if the weakness, what you're doing to work on it? A absolutely. And by the way, if you're involved in something like. Uh, you know, a Toastmasters, right, or a debate team or something. Um, and and I'm, I'm addressing that specifically to this group because I think 
you know, with this level of, of ex expertise and education that, that the audience may have, you know, there's probably a lot of folks that have been on debate teams or a lot of them that have uh, maybe been engaged or heard of Toastmasters, right? Or maybe if you haven't even, if, if you're not in Toastmasters, but you understand what it is, and if you were to, you know, tell someone you're interviewing with, well, you know, sometimes I have a, a, a challenge speaking in public, but I've heard about Toastmasters. And I'm going to go and, and I've made a commitment to, to, to work on that. And I'm, I'm going to pursue signing up Toastmasters and, and practice my public speaking. Again, you've presented them with um, a potential weakness, but you've identified a way that you intend to solve that or address that and, and make that sort of self-improvement. I mean, does that, if, if I were to tell you that, Nancy, if you were inter to interview me and I were to bring that to you, would you think that I had made it up or, or how believable is something like that to you? I think it's more believable rather than, you know, having some kind of answer that you could look, you know, Google on the internet and then come up and say, well, my weakness is this. If you can really talk a little bit more about it and put it in context, because, you know, context is, is a lot of that as well, right? It's not just an answer, it's the context. And you were talking about your story. Um, so when you tell it in terms of your story, um, I, I think that becomes more real. Absolutely. And, and again, it, it personalizes it, right? You can say, I've heard of Toastmasters, or I've been in Toastmasters, or I admire the debate team, and I'd like to be as good as they are when it comes to presenting, you know, my side of the story. I, you know, again, that, that makes it personal. And by the way, so just interestingly enough, from on, on, the, on, on the, connect, the personal connection level, and this may not be something, well, this is not something that I would think everyone would be able to do, but quite uh, coincidentally, when my daughter went to interview with this woman-owned, top 1% luxury market real estate, I mean, she doesn't go to the bottom, right? <laughs> she goes straight to the top. So she interviewed with the CEO of this company, by the way. So so she asked her mom if, she, if her mom could check on the internet and find out what time they closed. Her, what her mom did is her mom called and said, oh, my daughter's interviewing for this for this position. And my daughter called me in tears. She goes, oh, my gosh. She goes, Dad, now the CEO thinks that my mom is trying to help me get this job, and I don't know what to do. And she gave mom her personal email address and said, you know, go ahead and email me. I said, L I said you can leverage that. I said, that's not a mistake you made. I said, but now you can use that personal email, email address from that CEO that that mom gave to your mom and submit your resume directly. Now you'll stand out, right? Um, and, and so when she interviewed with that person, my, my daughter also uh, does um, modeling and wakeboard commercials and stuff. And, and we have a lake here in Austin that she, and a couple of lakes around here. So she frequents these lakes with a number of her friends and they go wake surfing, I guess is what you call it, right? And so that's on her resume. And and this lady looked and she goes, oh, it looks like you've done some modeling. I've done some modeling, and and that was a connection. She says, oh, by the way, it looks like you uh, you wake surf. Do you know you know so and so? And 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 my kids said, oh yeah, I, I I surf with so and so. And they said, well, I know their dad. Turns out, all of the friends that my that my daughter wake surfs with on these boats are are the the children of the parents that the CEO is friends with. And, you know, it was another instant connection. So if you could make these instant connections. And another thing, by the way, when my when my daughter came to visit me uh, in Washington, we made an appointment to go see our Texas legislators. We met with Senator Cruz, Senator Cornyn, Congressman Doggett, and uh, we attended House Ways and Means uh, Committee that he presented fiscal responsibility on. She put that in her resume. When she was interviewing with the staff guy that was driving, uh, didn't have a resume in front, he said, oh, I see you've got some work experience on the Hill. I worked on the Hill for two years. What did you think? Oh, she said, well, it was an interesting experience. That's another connection. She was never working on the Hill. But, I mean, those are the, those are the connections. If you could look for those and leverage those. And, again, who wants their mom to call the CEO and say, hey, my kid's looking for a job at your company? That's embarrassing. My, my poor kid just couldn't even catch her breath, right? However, I said leverage that. That's happened. You right. know, life is going to happen. Take those and leverage those. Does that answer your question? Yeah, I think that's a great example of how to, you know, try to make those personal connections so you do stand out because you do, you know, when you talk about ACM interview, it's actually making something that will make you memorable afterwards and say, oh, I remember that person I interview who? And I think, you know, that, that's really important. Well, a lot of our, you know, we're, we're an honor society. So the students, uh, you know, that are at a Kappa Nu, um, have this opportunity through Ada Kappa to get all kinds of experience through volunteering with their chapter, teaching others, 
um, you know, tutoring, going out in their communities and doing things, and um, you know, how do they? They're required to do service. How would you recommend that they go ahead and put that on their resume and in, in, incorporate that experience they're getting? Sometimes they don't think about it as experience, what they're learning, what they're doing, all these important things, or their roles, you know, being role models for others, um, you know, doing all that kind of uh, work. How would you? How would you? advise them to use that within their interview and even on their resume. Absolutely. So I would, I would most certainly leverage that. Again, you don't think, well, yeah, I mentored somebody or I was a, you know, math tutor for somebody. Those are important things to put down. Now, did you get paid for that? That's immaterial. That's experience. It may not be work experience that you got paid for, like in, as employment experience. Maybe you did get paid to be a tutor, or maybe you did get you know some sort of compensation. But that, those are all experiences, Nancy. Those make us who we are, right? So, um, as an example, my um, when I was a kid, I went to summer camp. It was all you know horseback riding and and you know swimming on on in the creeks and the lakes and tire swings and you know archery and campfire stuff. When my kid went to camp, and I thought that's what she was doing. She says, "Well, can you drop me off at camp?" I took her to camp. This camp was a camp. <clears throat> excuse me for. Um, underprivileged and and disadvantaged. No, this is not that's not the correct word. Let me just explain. So she went to camp. And she took a, a one-week intensive course to understand how to deal with um, a, down, a Down syndrome child. And what I mean by that is, she they taught her when when you're with it and you'll get a you'll get assigned a Down syndrome child. You're in the Down syndrome, you know, compartment of this camp. When they and they may in turn reach out and bite you out of just whatever. That's what they do. You know, they said you don't pull your hand right away. Your, your initial reaction is to pull your hand up. But what you do is you push inwards, and that releases the, the bite, you know, the grip, and then you pull your hand away. So her experience at camp was learning how to deal with these children, and she put that on her resume. Now, I had to help her rewrite it. She put her initial, her initial line item was endured intensive training, blah, blah, blah. I said, no, 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 no. <laughs> you don't. That sounds like it was a chore for you. You want to say completed intensive training to learn how to understand how to deal with Down syndrome children, you know, in a learning environment. So you use phrases and words like that, that, that convey the accomplishment and maybe enduring was, was a more accurate term, but from a, from an employer's perspective, they want to know that you completed, they don't care if it was hard to you endured it. That's kind of inherent, right? So these, these service activities you've had, these mentoring activities you've had, those are important. Now, my, my daughter also, you know, taught Sunday school here, uh, for the, for the small children. And so she, in, in her cover letter, she said, you know, I think you can benefit from my leadership. I said, they're not going to ask you to be a leader. They may they may appreciate your leadership abilities and understanding. I said, but put down the fact that you respect chain of command because leadership is about chain of command. I can hear at the Pentagon. I've got a chain of command that goes so far up I can't even see the top. So it's important to to leverage things like that a mentorship or leadership experience. And and again, you can use that term. Learns to respect chain of command, chain of custody, authority, those kinds of things as part of your leadership experience, part of your mentorship experience. Does that address the question that you just asked me, Nancy? Yeah, I, I think so. And I think, you know, I always, um, I always ask uh, interviewees to give me an example of how they've done, you know, how they've dealt with a difficult situation or how have you improved a process or how have you um, dealt with a difficult uh, colleague and things like that to try to get their experience of, of how they've, you know, how they've mitigated these circumstances. And I think, I know when I talk to a lot of our honor students uh, in the roles they have, I think these are great examples of how you improved a process maybe with your chapter. It might not have been paid experience, but how you improved a process of an event you ran or how you learned to take minutes or presentations by doing things at your chapter. So I think um, there might be a lot of good examples that could be in there because I think I, I always ask those questions do you Phil do you ask people to give you examples of when they've handled certain kinds of situations that might mimic the workplace absolutely and so when when I was reviewing my resume the resume that my daughter put you know forth and she had things like you know, uh, I forget how she phrased it, uh, how we met with Congressman Dog, And again, we sat in, in his speech about, you know, to the House Ways and Means Committee about fiscal responsibility. Afterwards, he took us to lunch. 
he we went into into the into the Longworth building there, and, and we had we had a, a nice room where he he we we put our our uh, portfolios down, and he brought our lunch back and had a conversation with him. And I was amazed, and I'm sure a lot of your your the the, the, the audience here has the same ability to do this to to convey to someone like Congressman Doggett how and her comment floored me, Nancy. She said I was so touched by your comment on fiscal responsibility, because if our government takes on debt that we can't pay, that impacts my generation, not necessarily your generation, but my generation. And that resonated with him, right? So when she put that on her resume, we I, I, I forget how it was worded initially. I said, but don't, don't make it look, I, it was something like hosted meeting with Congressman. I said, no, he hosted us. So if you're asked about this, and you may be asked, by the way, be prepared to defend every bullet point of your resume, every fact, every statement. Be prepared to. And I said, if you're asked about how you hosted something, you, you will not have an answer that's going to be satisfactory. He hosted us. You please put on there that you provided feedback to him about his uh, uh, delivery to the House Ways and Means Committee about fiscal responsibility. Those are key comments that you can defend. You know, assume you're in a court of law, you know, here you're with Judge Judy or Judge Wapner, or hey, you know, and, and you're having to answer a question about what you did. It's important to be able to take things like that and provide an example, as you say, provide an example of your experience in a particular area. And again, that personalizes it for you and it identifies the strength and, and the the world today is more focused on outcomes, right? They don't care that you endured something. The outcome was that now you know CPR. Now you know how to handle a Down syndrome child. Now you know how to handle, you know, an unresponsive group that you're soliciting information from to drive, uh, you know, a chapter to success in a particular initiative, right? So those are, I think, ways that you can, again, clearly identify your accomplishments, the outcomes, and those will also reveal some of the strengths that you may not realize you have, Nancy. Uh, I, I agree. I think uh, sometimes we forget where we learn some things and, you know, how we can leverage that in the workplace and even particularly in the interview because you want to get the job and have the opportunity to go show those skills. But you, I, I know I like examples that people give me, very tangible examples of how they dealt with a situation that might have been difficult or might have been very challenging for them or might have, um, you know, they really had to work hard at. It was something completely different outside of what they do because we have all engineers, all of our students are, you know, they're all top-performing students. But I think it's those other kinds of experiences and other kinds of, uh, they call them soft skills, that, you know, employers are also looking for. So not just great technical skills and ability to do the engineering work, but the other kinds of skills, like working on teams, um, you know, giving examples of those kinds of things. I think, um, I think when you interview or when you're working with people on acing an interview, how do you recommend they talk about those kinds of skills? Well, so that's a great point. I was recently interviewed by Stephen Ibaraki, and I was just so flattered that he would choose me to interview uh, for his his um, his uh, set of interviews, basically, right? Stephen Ibaraki is a world-class uh, entrepreneur. He's a venture capitalist. He's He's worked with over a hundred thousand CEOs to hone their skills and why he chose me. I, I, I think it's because I had interviewed him uh, with the rising stars, but he said, Hey, you know, I, I'd, I'd like to put forth some of the things you've done. And one of the things he asked me about, and again, I, I went back Nancy in my work history and I was, I was recalling a time when uh, the, the, the term management by objective or MBO was popular back in the mid eighties. Right. So <laughs> I was, you, you, you remember MBOs? <laughs> Absolutely. So I was given an MBO by my supervisor who really had no idea what it was either. And he said, hey, look, we've got these two flight simulators for these two Apache helicopters. Um, and by the way, my background uh, is a hardware engineer. I have, a, I have a hardware engineering degree. And so he said, your MBO is to figure out why when somebody is in one of these 20-foot domes that has an Apache cockpit in it and they turn their head to look for the other ship there is, or they fire the gun or whatever it is, that there's a, you know, a sub-second delay. Figure out why that delay is and fix it. And I'm thinking, I didn't write the software. I didn't build the hardware. I didn't install this. How am I going to uh, you know, achieve this MBO? And that's all I'm graded on. So here's what I did. I and I 
invited back when you would, you know, type and uh, have the secretary type in a memo and put it in everybody's box. And we had uh, the all the hardware, all the hardware folks, all the software folks in a big one of the big long conference rooms. Interestingly enough, Nancy, the software guy sat on one side of the table, the hardware guy sat on the other side of the table, and I'm here, and, and I, I, I call it making stone soup. Again, I didn't know any of the lines of code. I didn't know any of the hardware. I mean, I built some of the hardware, but one of the very small pieces to integrate the flight controller, right? And I said, and I used terms that were inclusive. I said, we have this issue. Our product is is exhibiting this symptom. How can we how can we address this? What do what do we all think that you know the issue may be? The software guy said, well. You know, I did I did add some comments of lines of code. It shouldn't have affected anything, and I recompiled it, and it looked like it compiled okay, but I can take a look at that. And I said, great. W- would you mind doing that and come back to the next meeting? And the hardware guys, I looked at them. I mean, I I, I just looked straight at them. And one guy says, well, you know, I, I, I did have some, some hardware that I that's no longer available, and I, I got some compatible hardware that should be a direct replacement. I'll go and see if, that's, if that may be the issue. I said, that's great. Thank you very much. Let's reconvene next week. We did that over a period of several weeks. And without me doing anything other than asking questions and leading the conversation in an inclusive fashion, rather than, hey, your software is wrong. Hey, your hardware is breaking this, right? We we achieved the outcome that was desired for the team and for the company. And we, you know, we won millions of dollars worth of, of bids from the government because we'd resolved this issue. So that's one of the things, right? And another area that I, I was at, uh, at, at NASA a couple of years ago, and they said, we've got this problem. We've had the vendor in, they can't figure it out. They gave me six weeks to try to figure this out. This, uh, this uh, out. And I said, great. So I went out there uh, and I said, where's my computer? Where do I sit? They said, oh, we don't have time for you to get a badge or a computer. That's too long of an onboarding process. You look over, you know, um, I forget what his name is, Shoulder, right? And, and, and see what he does. So I looked over Matthew's shoulder and I said, well, type this. He typed that. And I said, well, look at this. And so we used the whiteboard and some things. And in, in four weeks, instead of six weeks that they had budgeted, we resolved the issue. And again, I use terms like we and, 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 and things, and we include other people. We resolved their issue, and I left money on the table, Nancy. I left two weeks' worth of money, and at my rate, that's a lot of money. And I'm thinking, well, okay, I left money on the table from a business perspective, but from a customer's perspective, they saved money. They called me back. Nancy, to do two other projects, which I was able to do remote thanks to COVID, right? And one of them uh, provided me with a year's worth of income in six months. So by using these inclusive terms, right, and including other people, um, and and by communicating that story. When I communicated those stories to the people I interviewed for this Pentagon position, they said, that's great, you're in. That's great. Well, if somebody asked a question, I know I have a real pet peeve if someone doesn't send a follow-up. I really, I, I really think they're not that interested in the job. But somebody asked a question, if uh, the interview doesn't result in a hiring, is it okay to go back and ask um, if there's something, there's a reason why or something that you can do to improve? Absolutely. You have every right to follow up. And, and, and not, not just to uh, – for, for any other reason, then you can say – you know, I, I'd like to know how I can improve. You know, what is it that, that uh, you know, that you found that, that was a deciding factor, right? You can use those and spin it in a positive way. Control that narrative. Yes, absolutely. That's, that's, a, that's a great suggestion. So we're really coming to the end of our, our time together. It went really fast, Bill, so so much great information. I really want to thank you. Uh, immediately following this session, we are having a networking session in this interactive platform called Spatial Chat. Now, Stacy told you, The link is in the resource tab. So I want you to go right over there before you leave, link on that, and come on over to Spatial Chat because you'll be able to talk to some of our experts, some of our other speakers. We actually have Texas Instruments who's going to be over there with some of their recruiters. So if you're looking for a job, you want to talk to TI, you want to talk to some of our other companies who've said they're looking for people. Uh, I don't know, Phil, if you can join us if you've got a little bit of time, but I really want to encourage people to come over, jump over to Spatial Chat with us by clicking on that link. And, um, you know, that way we can have some more interaction because that's really, you know, where a lot of this, that great networking happens that can lead to a job or you can learn more of these kinds of skills. We've got one more session this afternoon at 4 o'clock Eastern. It's negotiating and then another networking session at 5. So, so Phil, uh, thanks so much. There's so much more we could talk about. I want to thank you for your time today. Great session. Um, Really appreciate it. Do you have any final words? 
Uh, I, I I appreciate the opportunity to present. Unfortunately, I'm under a pretty tight deadline here, and I don't know. I will make every effort to attend spatial chat, and I'll see if I can carve out a few minutes, maybe ten or fifteen minutes. But I I'm I'm under the gun on this particular deadline this week. Uh, um, but I appreciate the opportunity. Thank you so much. It's been a great well, honor to, to present with to you. Again, uh, so much, and thanks everyone for being here. Hopefully, we'll see you over in spatial chat and. Um, Thanks. Thanks so much to Phil. Thank you so much, Nancy. Have a wonderful day.